Thank you to all our speakers. We heard, first of all, from Rahil Raza uh, about the historical uh, basis of Islam, the lack of wish to establish political power, a form of secularism that prevailed historically, um, as opposed to the tensions of today, um, partly uh, fermented by the export of this ideology by oil-producing countries. Um, the different responses from Canada with resistance, the UK with some accommodation. She also set the scene with uh, some striking statistics in her film. Margin then made the case for compatibility. Uh, Islam, uh, uh, the, the history, the historical precedent, the theological precedent for uh, secularism and Islam being compatible, um, with the exceptions possible in Andalusia and the Ottomans. Um, the current intention to impose Sharia law being a modern, modern innovation, an imposition of modern concepts on historic and ancient scripture, and politically, political translations of, of, of those scriptures. Um, but can, can the genie be, be put back in the bottle? And finally, Douglas, just I think he uh, went on to say that the, um, uh, perhaps echoing the, the point that Shafak Pafe made this morning about the uh, resurgence of this problem after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, uh, which had been kept in check somehow during the Cold War, that this is a problem that we're facing now in the last 20, 30 years, which no one's prepared to, and our response has been woefully inadequate. Uh, a failure to call a spade a spade, however understandable, has compounded the problem. Uh, and perhaps a slightly concerning view that the European public thinks that Islam is incompatible with Western values and liberal democracy. Um, so with, with that background, uh, I'm going to open it to questions. Uh, please put your hands up, say who you are, and wait for microphones before you speak. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Berg here, followed by the gentleman at the back there, please. Yes. Although I take issue with the idea that there's a clear distinction between in militant and fundamentalist Islams and not, uh, Islamists and non-fundamentalist Islamists, because people do who, let's say, vary a little bit in their views according to the circumstances, is what I w would I'd like to challenge most of all, is that the, the answer or the problem lies not, uh, or the immediate problem in which needs to be tackled is not so much within the Muslim community as in the failure of our political system to deal with the weakness in the political system. Because what is happening is that uh, community leaders, rather than imams in the main, say, oh, we can deliver uh, the Muslim vote to your party if you, if you go along with what we say. Now, overall, that's about 4% block of the vote, which is very attractive. In many constituencies, it's 15%, which is very decisive. And that, and there's, it's particularly the delivery to the Labour Party, but it's not exclusively. Sorry, can, can we yeah. wrap up? Uh, uh, so, oh, isn't it a matter that it is the politicians, like in America, in the civil rights movement, where the, the roads were lost in standing up in the South, they've got to be prepared to take it on. And that's rather than allow our democracy to be exploited in its, weak, its weakest point. Thank you. Do you, mm. Do you Sorry? Oh, should we get, okay, so we'll, we'll pick up another one. So the gentleman in the check shirt, I think it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, I really admire all the speakers and thanks for uh, some really interesting speeches. Um, I'm a, an atheist and a secularist and uh, I'm also, uh, strangely enough, a PhD student studying the Protestant Reformation, which is a strange cocktail of things to be, but there you go. Um, and there are a lot of people talking about uh, reform in Islam and that is uh, an aspiration I share as well. But I just wonder, um, looking at the Protestant Reformation, uh, it kind of reveals that there's no real guarantee that a reformation in itself leads to a prosperous, more secular, safer uh, society. And I just wondered, what strategies are there to ensure that uh, a reformation in other religions, if needed, uh, have positive results for everybody? Because it is a, a great aspiration. I just hope that it can be, uh, it can't repeat the mistakes of reformations that have taken place in the past. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more from the gentleman with the beard, please. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, my name's Will T.G. Miller. I work for the Kurdistan Secular Center. I'm also a former Muslim. I hope you don't mind me premising this point very slightly. I just wanted to start off by saying that religious freedom, we don't have religious freedom in this country really, in the sense that Jews can't walk around sacrificing goats, Christians can't walk around burning witches, and Muslims cannot you know, uh, beat their wives if they're uh, disobedient. And that is from the Quran, by the way, like Majid, I've memorized a bit of it. So, given that, um, we don't really have it, but there's one thing we do allow in the name of religious freedom, which is religious dress. So women are allowed to wear the niqab, the burqa, the hijab even, right? And we, we do this because we say, okay, this is, your, this is your religious right, this is your religious freedom to wear this. What we do by saying this is we legitimize an interpretation of Islam which says the woman's hair is an, ob is, an, is an object to be fetishized, to be hidden, to be sexualized. We legitimize that, and we call that modesty. And by doing that, all Muslim women who don't wear the veil, like our very own Rahil Raza over there, become outside of that modesty. They become immodest. At worst, they become whores, or you know, these horrible, dirty words are applied to these women. And my own girlfriend, who is a conservative Muslim who wears the hijab, is unable to take it off for fear of being branded in that way by her social circle, by her family, and it's, it's very sad for me to see that. So again, we, we, we don't allow religious, religious freedom because of the harm principle, correct? I think that the hijab, the burqa, are harmful enough to legitimize banning them based on that very same principle, that what you're saying is, if you don't wear it, you're a whore. Could you please tell me what you think of that? Thank you. Okay. So we've got... Um... Sorry, uh, so we've got a uh, question on the, uh, uh, um, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting. Yeah, I, oh, you've got, okay, sorry, go ahead. No. Oh, so if I may, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the, the question on community leaders and the mis how to avoid the mistakes of the Reformation. And uh, I, I know my co-panelists are also free to pick any of those questions and address them as they like. And I know Rahil wants to come in on the last comment there. By the way, you read that passage very fast. <laughs> you clearly memorized the Quran. I mean, that, that was some Arabic speed there you had. Um, the question on the community leaders. Yes, I, you know, this raises a huge question about, you know, the mistake of politicians when engaging in this debate is similar to the mistake of those who are ideologically driven to encourage fundamentalism and theocratic Islamism within Muslim communities. Those are those who I've referred to as the regressive left. Politicians do so for different reasons. They may not be ideologically driven, they're just bloody spineless. And the reason they're spineless is because they have to... Look, no, I, no, I ran for parliament, okay? I have an experience with this, okay? Now, I, I think partly why I, I really didn't fit in in that world is the, the, the fact that people are prepared to say what pleases the electorate. Well, if the electorate is demanding something that is fundamentally at odds with the interests of this country, then a politician's job is still to try and gain those votes. And that's why their language is always by default um, bland, because they don't want to offend anyone. You know, you try running a campaign with Islamism and how to challenge it as one of your main feature points, right? It, it, the problem is it becomes incredibly polarizing. So what politicians have done with the community leader aspect is, as you rightly pointed out, there's this tendency that those who are deemed as community leaders invariably are the religious leaders within the community. Now, forgive me for pointing out, but I can guarantee you the vast majority of Muslims in the world, especially in the West, but even in the world outside of those countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, where praying is perhaps enforced, but certainly in those countries like Pakistan, where it's not enforced by law, but still one is expected to pray, the vast majority of Muslims do not pray five times a day. What does that tell us about their attitudes when it comes to elections in countries like Pakistan? The Jamaat Islami, the kind of Muslim Brotherhood of Pakistan, has never won an outright election, right? So what's going on when politicians go into Muslim communities, a bit like neo-Orientalists, you know, bigotry of low expectations, and think somehow that when a Muslim wants to express themselves, that they must automatically want to do so through their local religious leader, who is invariably the least educated within the community, who has the worst track record on gender rights, on homophobia issues, who really doesn't understand the world, but somehow the politician is pandering to this guy for votes. So there's a self-reinforcement cycle going on here. And actually, I can assure you that uh, most Muslims in this country would rather speak as women, as husbands, as fathers, as mothers, as educationalists, as doctors, as nurses, as street cleaners, as whatever they are, because they have multiple identities. And it's high time that our politicians recognized that we are not 
uh, unilateral, sorry, uh, sort of one-dimensional creatures who can only ever speak as Muslims and who only ever want to be identified as Muslims. And so there's that form of... There's that form of bigotry of low expectation. Imagine you had a problem with some white young lads who are out of work because you know, the fast pace of change in this country has affected their employment abilities. You know, there's a, I feel strongly about this too. There's a disproportionate number of young white men who are out of work. There's a higher proportion of them in prison and there's a disproportionate number of, of them going, succeeding today in the education system and achieving university degrees, right? So white, white young working class men are underrepresented. Now, if you, as a politician, wanted to solve that problem, would you go and find a priest? <laughs> right? So why on earth are we going to Muslim religious leaders to solve the problem of delinquency within Muslim communities? That delinquency, especially from up north, is created by joblessness, by a lack of education, by their parents coming from villages in countries like Pakistan, from Mirpur, to be precise, who have a village mindset and they came to this country and have transferred a lot of that to how they've raised their children. There are genuine social problems. If you care, for social justice, a message here directly to the regressive left, if you care for social justice as you claim to, then stop being racist with this bigotry of low expectations, thinking Muslims can only ever want to speak through their religious leader. It's ridiculous. You would never do that with white people. Finally, sorry, but on that point of the reformation, very quickly on this one, because I know I took a lot of time on that last question, that reformation and whether it's possible. Yes, uh, the Protestant reformation was incredibly bloody. Um, you know, there, was, there were wars, a lot of people were massacred. And even in fact, you know, we now look back in history and say, thank God that the Protestant reformation happened. Well, the, the Protestants also massacred a whole bunch of people. You know, in Germany, the peasants, they killed them en masse, right? So their hands weren't, you know, uh, uh, blood-free. They, they engaged in a lot of murder. And so in a sense, when we see what's happening with ISIS today, people say, where's the Muslim reform? And I use the word reform so as to not, not say that we're going to replicate the Reformation, which has a particular Christian context to it. But where's the Muslim reform? Well, actually, part of the fact, the proof that we're in it is what ISIS is doing. Those bloody wars are... Uh, uh, largely young men who are feeling threatened by modernity and the challenges that modernity poses to a literalist, vacuous understanding of religion. So they've decided to insist that it's always been like this and we're going to enforce it exactly like this and if you don't like it, we're going to kill you. So we're in the middle of it as well. Um, but one of the only ways I think we're going to avoid some of those mistakes and ensure the success of the Muslim Reform Project is we require allies from public, from society, but also from within governments. And that touches on some of the stuff I said in my last answer as well. Um, the, to the young gentleman who asked the question, the, the niqab and burqa are very clearly Islamic symbols which are connected to a political agenda. And this has been presented to Muslim women as a boxed and packaged form of Islam, that if you step out of this, you're not considered a credible Muslim. You should read on the blog my story about how BBC had approached me to give a comment as a Muslim woman, and then they saw my picture on my website and decided I wasn't a good enough Muslim woman because I wasn't covered. And so uh, you're absolutely right. So in Canada, what we did, my organization, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, lobbied our government, who did the previous government, who had our year. And we are working on a show your face law. We don't use the term niqab or burqa, but essentially we say that showing your face in public space should be a requirement, which in other words means ban the burqa and the niqab. Sorry, great. Uh, lady here in the white shirt, then the chap in the blue shirt just behind her, and then to the chap nearest the speaker. Hi. Sorry, I come from Saudi Arabia. It's the first time I hold a mic. So, um, so in my country, um, People who spoke, who promoted secularism are sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes, and some are sentenced to death. Um, now, where I come from, I'm constant, constantly scrutinized for having um, liberal modern ideologies, um, and my safety is jeopardized in my country. But at the same token, um, 
I'm also criticized in this country for still being a Muslim. Um, I'm going to try to wrap this, forgive my nervousness, <laughs> but the question is, um, and, and I feel like there's some kind of denial as to these conservative, like, extremely religious countries, um, whether they're ruled by Sharia law only or by other factors, and I believe they are ruled by tribal law, other political agendas, so, which have men been mentioned by you. So, so if, if we were to remove Islam from the equation, how do we ensure that, how, how can we ensure that there would still be peace uh, given the political agenda and that the law wouldn't you know, dictate uh, another you know, forceful means to implement that, that you know, these, this, to serve this political agenda? Thank you very much. I'm going to catch my breath. Sorry, um, gentleman there in the blue shirt, please. Thank you. Um, Majid, um, I'm an um, atheist from a sort of Islamic background, technically from, from an apostate cult, but never mind. Um, <laughs> the question that I have for you really is that the overwhelming majority of my moderate Muslim friends, and I genuinely mean that they're moderate, they're, they're not sort of practicing, they're not that committed, they're pretty relaxed about it. They hate you with a passion, and they hate the reformers within Islamic circles with such vitriol and passion that I just find genuinely bizarre. Um, why is that, firstly? Um, I, I can tell you what they tell me about Muslim reformers. They think that they're all sellouts or Mossad agents or something of that sort. But what's your take on it? Um, and Douglas, given the numbers that you presented and the sort of statistics that you presented and the rise of uh, what's now being dubbed the alternative right and these kinds of uh, uh, dimwits is, is, is the only polite word that I can use, uh, where do you see this going? I mean, the level of social conflict that we're seeing and the rise of new forms of very anti-Semitic right-wing movements that are also anti-Islamic, uh, it's pretty scary. Where do you see this going? Okay. And finally, the uh, chap there. Could I ask everybody to please keep their comments as succinct as possible? Uh, uh, no, behind you. I've got the mic already. So. Um, yeah, my name is Imtia Shams. I'm a trustee of the BHA, but I also have, I, I, I do stuff with an organization called Faith to Faithless, so we work with apostates. Um, my question is about education on the topic of Islam. Um, this weirds people out because I think we need more Islam. And as an ex-Muslim who gets called the most out agent or ISIS, depending on what racist or whatever I'm talking to, um, w because everyone, like Douglas says, has a politicized, Islam is so politicized, everyone has a view. And, um, but there's actually some really amazing academic work when it comes to the history of Islam, theology, all this kind of stuff, like the late Patricia Crone, um, uh, Kizai Ali, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but none of this is in the wider public. So Muslims have a very, if I've got to be honest, a very shit Watertown version of Islam usually. They barely know what a madhab is often. They don't, I mean, the school of thought, they don't know a lot about Islam. Um, secular humans often also have the same problem. You know, we don't really know Islam. We just pick the bad bits and we're like, this is Islam and we're doing the same thing. Um, and I think the trick is that we need better education about Islam and Islams. You know, what, what historically it's just been all over the place. Uh, just like in any religion, as you'd expect. So, and, and the, the problem is we can then move it away from the Saudis who promote what I call like a cult version of Islam. So my question is, I'm not sure how this can be done. So this is not a question about theology or, you know, this is a question of uh, literacy, right? Um, how do we convert this amazing academic work uh, for, to make it digestible for people? Um, how do we co compete with the reams and reams of publishers that are funded by often Saudi Arabia and these kind of, you know, Azhar and all these kind of things? Um, I know uh, in Quilliam you have like the amazing Farhan Amer who does some fantastic stuff with, stuff with hermeneutics. But other than her, I don't really see that many people who are writing stuff that, you know, everyone else can read. 
I mean, the stuff I've had to read is just undigestible. So how do you do that? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, again, can I ask everybody to be quite quick? Go to yeah. Douglas these first. These are very, very good questions, and I want to sort of dwell on all of them, but let me be uh, um, very quick. First of all, uh, just a little bit about the Saudi point. I mean, with all of these regimes, we all just have to work out ourselves to what extent are they actually religious, and to what extent are they riding the tiger, and to what extent are they just taking the piss? And if you, if you go around London now, you will see all of the princes of these so holy religious countries who have flown over their Ferraris and raced them down Knightsbridge like Grand Theft Auto. And when, as they sometimes do, they crash one, they get out and leave it there and get into another. Um, life is a computer game for these rich brats. And I think, by the way, they don't get enough hell from this country or from anyone else for the hypocritical people they are. Because these are the same people who come to London and play the rich dauphin and go back and they take part in a system which enriches them, which kills everybody who would be our friends. And uh, I think it's, it's just the reprehensible situation this country is in, among others. As for very quickly, if I may, uh, um, uh, you're the gentleman there, I, I can't do justice to that excellent question, but just one thing. I, mean, I am, like a lot of other people, very nervous about the idea that the rest of time you know, has to be spent in a sort of Islamic theological discussion. You know, I, you know, I, there are some great box sets I still haven't seen. You know, and, <laughs> them, and I sort of think people are better off doing that than wading through Bukhari. And, you know, oh, this is a very interesting hadith. And, you know. Um, but uh, I will leave Majid to answer the wonderful question about why he's hated. Um, <laughs> but may I, say, may I say, as somebody who doesn't hate Majid, <laughs> that one explanation for this is that what he says hurts a lot of people. And as we all know, what hurts you most is what is most truthful. Um, and that may be one of the reasons why. As for your question of where is it going... Um, the, about the statistics I cited in Europe are, are, are not good, I'm afraid. Uh, not good at all. And one of the reasons is that for years now, everybody who has alerted anybody else to this problem has been smeared with the most vicious, the most violent, the most appalling uh, names, the career-ending names. And that has happened to everybody, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, white, black, brown. It's happened to everybody. I have black friends who've been called racists because of saying some things about extreme Islamist groups that aren't, you know, au fait. It's, it's been endless. And meantime, we have the serious problem of people totally lacking distinction on political sides that they feel generally opposed to. The continent now is awash with, our continent is awash with, rising parties of the right, not all of which are far right, certainly not all of which are fascist, some of which have voiced very big concerns about Islam. Instead of identifying everybody who voices these concerns as fascists, I think a much better use of our time is to look seriously at what they believe, really analyze the thoughts, really find out if they are anti-Semites, if they're actually racists, and so on and so forth. But you know, very few people exercise that kind of uh, judgment because they sort of need all of these guys to be Nazis. A lot of people do that because they kind of say, well, you know, if I can kind of call all those guys Nazis, then some way down the line I might be allowed to criticize Hizbut Tahir. You know, it's a sort of political uh, um, thing they do. Finally, very quickly, uh, 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 the previous round, but it answers two of the things, about the thing about political courage and also about the hijab. I've got to tell you this story. 13 years ago or so now, whenever it was, when France first banned the uh, headscarf in public buildings, I remember doing a BBC discussion with a, 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 a left-wing politician who will remain nameless, and uh, a, a Iranian journalist friend of mine uh, uh, who, uh, who, um, who, who is far more hardline than me on some of these questions. And uh, the question was on this. I said, well, you know, the French state has the right to do this. When, you know, when people say, who is the French government? Well, they are the government of the Republic of France, and you know, one can agree or disagree, but they do have that right. And um, um, anyhow... Uh, uh, the, the Labour politicians spent the entire program uh, uh, lamming into me and my uh, uh, Muslim Iranian colleague for, uh, for our stance. We were called Islamophobes, everything else. The usual, what one was going to get used to in the years ahead. But I'll never forget that when we exited the studio, uh, this person clapped me on the back and said, uh, never forget, Douglas, we're all with you. <laughs> and... 
and I said, uh, well, what about the half hour live on air we just, we, we just had, which was the more pertinent moment to make any such support felt. And the reply was straightforward. He said, you've got to understand, I've got a very large Muslim constituency. To which my Iranian friend said in one of the most beautifully polite Persian things, devastating things I've ever heard, said, ah, I see, you are a coward. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, Majid, Majid, would you care to explain why you're so universally hated? Right, so, uh, uh, okay, right. So listen, there's, there's a danger here that this particular uh, uh, question takes a life of its own and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, because you notice what just happened. The questioner didn't say universally hated, and no. that's how it got interpreted, yeah, right? right? We've got to be very careful. You're going to get me killed. We've got to be very careful. No, I'm not even joking. We've got to be very careful. Because actually, the sort of people that hate me are, of course, the Islamists, of course, the fundamentalists. And then what was described as moderate Muslims who behave moderately, yet don't like what I say. I would question, sir, whether they are moderate. I know you think they are. But actually, even ISIS, Al-Qaeda considers ISIS extreme today, right? <laughs> What does that tell you about the spectrum of opinion? When 50%, over 50% of Britain's Muslims, when asked, said yes, being homosexual should be made illegal. I suspect you're hearing from that same 50% who hate me. But there's another 50% that don't, but by definition they're not vocal, because by definition they haven't gone out there to define themselves as Muslim and engage with the public as Muslims. They're not wearing Islam on their sleeve. But obviously, because of what I say, I have to come, uh, 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 come uh, um, against those who are wearing Islam on their sleeve, for whom Islam is their primary identity. So when they hear me criticize the notion of Islam being your primary identity, of course it's going to upset them. I'll tell you a small story, a little anecdote. When I was uh, around 17 years old, and I first became an Islamist a year earlier, and I joined Hizb al-Tahrir, and I remember standing outside a mosque one day, distributing a flyer that literally said, the Prophet Muhammad was involved in politics, help us re-establish the caliphate. That was the title of the flyer. And as a young Hizb al lad, I was distributing this outside a mosque. Out walked a big, like a lot bigger than me, older than me, bearded religious Muslim with a prayer cap, and walked straight up to me and punched me in the face. <laughs> right? And he said, how dare you defile our religion by bringing into it politics? This is when I was 17 years old. Fast forward. And I've traveled a lot around the world to challenge extremism, including in Pakistan, where I went to uh, the week that M Malala was shot in the head. I went to Mengora, the town where she was shot, and organized a public protest against the Taliban in that town. I've also been to Quetta, which was the headquarters of the Taliban, and organized a huge rally, which Newsnight filmed, with thousands of Balochi students in the university and me speaking against the Islamist theocrats. On that trip in Pakistan, I was sitting in a cafe, having a, a, a coffee, minding my own business, and up walks a bearded Muslim, and punches me in the face. <laughs> and this time he says, how dare you promote secularism in the Muslim countries? Now, what those two anecdotes tell you, apart from the fact that people seem to like punching me in the face, <laughs> is that actually in the, in the gap of me, from me being 17 to me being, uh, I think I was around 28, 29 when I went to Pakistan, maybe around 29, right? In that gap, in those intervening years, those Islamists, such as myself, who had been advocating for a caliphate, had been so successful in shifting public opinion within Muslim context that we'd gone from a state where Muslims were punching other Muslims for, for, ha for having the audacity to try and mix Islam and politics to where they're punching them and now far worse than punching them, and I got off lucky there, uh, uh, but killing them, chopping their heads off for suggesting that Islam should be separated from politics. So the point is it wasn't always like this. It's, it's like this now because of the success of Islamist campaigning. And Islamist campaigning has been successful because in fact in the 90s, during Islamist heyday, they did manage to take the cream of the crop of Western Muslims and across the world, I know in particular with Britain, Muslims who were studying at Oxford, Cambridge, I did my Arabic and law degree at, the, at SOAS and my master's in political theory at the LSE, People that were going to some of the best universities of the world were joining Islamist organizations. The, the man who is accused in Pakistan of beheading Daniel Pearl went to the LSE, for God's sake. right? So when they took the cream of the crop from the 90s and the zeitgeist of the 90s for young rebellious Muslims was to become an Islamist, no wonder that you end up with a situation today where these so-called moderates who 
behave, as Douglas, Douglas will say, hypocritically enjoy all the benefits of the West. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd gone out for a drink with you. They hypocritically enjoy all the benefits of the West. And even if it's not alcohol, it certainly is the freedoms of this country and our democratic system, while romanticizing a form of a medieval caliphate in their minds, because that cancer, that ideology has already entered. As we know from those who join ISIS, you don't need to be devout to advocate for a theocratic ideology. It's already being romanticized, which is why people convert overnight from being street pimps to becoming ISIS recruits, because a lot of that ideology has already been internalized. That's what we're experiencing. And it's that section of society, of course they're going to oppose me. I say often, if, that, if those guys, the sort of guys, the over 50% of British Muslims who support the banning of homosexuality in this country, if they were supporting what I'd be saying, I'd be incredibly worried. I would be incredibly worried. It means I'm saying something wrong. Of course they're going to oppose what I'm saying because that's where the state of opinion is today. Finishing off on the question of Saudi Arabia, and by the way, I want to encourage you to continue speaking out. I think you're incredibly brave, and your article for Sisterhood magazine on the Saudi guardianship laws was fantastic. And it's a rare thing to sit in a... By the way, she's not Saudi born in Britain. She's Saudi from Saudi Arabia. And it's a rare thing to hear that insight and to hear that voice because she has to one day maybe go back and visit family. So I just want to acknowledge what you said. And I think you're right that actually when societies justify things by religion, it tells us a lot more than just what, what they're using to justify their behavior, which is the religion. Of course, it tells us that they are also a, an incredibly misogynist society, an incredibly tribal society, and also a poorly educated society. All those things are, I think, in, in, uh, they, they're intertwined, and we can't separate them. They go hand in hand. If you look at countries like Afghanistan, where religion is justified to a hell of a lot, it also happens to be an incredibly tribal society, likewise with Pakistan and honor killings. So I think those things are inseparable, and I don't think we can separate them. I think that those societies have to evolve in all of their attitudes, whether they're tribalism, whether they're understanding of religion, their misogyny, their hatred of women, and all of those things come hand in hand. Um, and, and, and I'll leave the other, okay. other I questions. I know Keith over. is looking yeah. at his watch, but I'm going to take one minute to yeah. just respond very quickly to the young lady to say that use the freedoms of this country to develop your, your voice and speak out more, because this is what the beauty of living here is. To the young gentleman who spoke about education, uh, this is what Quilliam is doing. This is what we are trying to do is provide an alternate narrative. It's not a theology of Islam that's beautiful, but actually an alternate narrative to the narrative of how the extremists have interpreted Islam. And last but not the least, Majid, you don't have the monopoly on being hated. Uh, it, <laughs> it comes in many ways and forms. And I will just end on a very uh, fine anecdote here about uh, the latest hate mail that I got was, uh, you know, you terrible uh, four-letter words, uh, Zionist agent, you must be living in a mansion, amount of money that is being paid to you to do all of this. And I wrote back and I said, you know, from my two-bedroom apartment, I'm looking down at my high end eye and wishing that the Zionists would really listen to you and provide that final thing. So thank you very much. <laughs> I, I'm, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time for any further questions, so this is the last session of the day. We'll invite Terry to come and uh, uh, give some closing remarks. But again, just please could you thank uh, our three speakers, Rahil Raza, Douglas Murray, and Majid Nawaz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.